Shabbat Shalom, everybody. Welcome to our fifth podcast, I believe it is. Um, if you read this week's blog, uh, you know that this week I'm talking to you about the uh, Melchizedek. And this is a very, uh, very interesting topic, a very important topic. And uh, before I get into it, however, uh, I will disclose that I will be uh, recording one more podcast uh, before next weekend uh, because of the feasts coming up, the Moedim, I thought it would be a good idea to um, record a podcast kind of uh, talking about how times are done and why we know certain days uh, like the Passover and uh, Hamatzah, the uh, Feast of Unleavened Bread, is going to be on the days that we... Uh, are going to be celebrating celebrating them, and uh, I want to also kind of go over what the Torah teaches, what we do, and as well as what we do under uh, the priesthood of Yeshua, being of the order of Melchizedek, um, for Passover and leavened bread, first fruits, so on. Um, so after that, I'll I'll record that podcast, and you probably uh, will not be receiving another podcast from me for. Uh, possibly the duration of the, that particular feast time, at least uh, until after um, First Fruits. I, I will continue to do recordings uh, up until Shavuot, and I will uh, hopefully do another podcast uh, te uh, teaching and talking about Shavuot in, in relation to then and now. Uh, so uh, that's pretty much the news as far as that goes. Um, uh, okay, so we're talking about Melchizedek. Uh, if you have your scriptures handy, uh, turn in the Tanakh to the Torah. Um, we are going to look at the very first mention of Melchizedek, uh, which is in Bereshit or Genesis chapter 14. Um, now, to this point, we've been talking about Avram, who is now Abraham. Um, and here in this story, he, uh, he went and he rescued Lot. Uh, from having been kidnapped or taken hostage or whatever you want to call it. And um, here uh, it says in verse 1 of chapter 14, And it happened in the days of uh, Emrah. And by the way, if you hear all this rattling on the pod, uh, on the, on iTunes or wherever you're listening, that's my shirt. <laughs> I don't know what material this is, but it's very loud, and I apologize for that. Okay, um, verse 1. And it happened in the days of Amraphel, king of Shinar, uh, Ariok, king of Elisar, uh, Hedor Lamar, uh, king of Elam, and Tidal, king of Goim, uh, that these made war on Bara. Let's see here. You know what? Let me skip ahead. I apologize. Here we go. The king of Sodom, this is verse 17, by the way, same chapter. The king of Sodom went out to meet him after his return from defeating uh, Hedor Lamar and uh, the kings that were with him, the valley of Shaveh, uh, which is the king's valley. But Melchizedek, king of Salem, uh, brought out bread and wine. He was a priest of El Elyon, a God, uh, God Most High. Uh, he blessed him, saying, Blessed is Avram of El Elyon, maker of Shemayim, heaven, and Aretz, earth. And blessed is El Elyon, who has delivered your foes into your hand, and he gave him a tenth of everything. The king of Sodom said to Avram, uh, Give me the people and take the possession for yourself. Avram said to the king Basically, no. God, uh, God supplies all my needs. So that that's uh, the first mention of Melchizedek. Um, now the next mention, I, I'll put this in my blog. The first mention, uh, well, the the number of times Melchizedek is mentioned as as an actual title or possible name, uh, but as I, I I actually view it more of as as a title. Um, Melchizedek is actually mentioned in Scripture from uh, the Torah all the way to the Brit Hadashah. Uh, 12 times. Uh, you can find that in uh, Barashi 14, uh, Tehillim or Psalm 110 and verse 4, and then again uh, for the last time in Ivri or Hebrews um, chapters 5 through 7, and uh, it goes into more detail as to how it relates to Yeshua, and we will be getting into that in a moment. Now, um, this is a very mysterious character that you find in Torah, uh, the Melchizedek, king of Salem. Now, Melchizedek in Hebrew is made up of two words, Molek and Zedek. Uh, Molek is king, and Zedek is, uh, like, you know, moral rightness or righteousness. 
So he's the king of righteousness, but he's also the king of Salem, which uh, is said to be an earlier version of, uh, or earlier name of Jerusalem or Jerusalem. Um, Salem basically means the same thing as Shalom. It's wholeness, peaceable, uh, completeness. Uh, so he is Melchizedek, king of righteousness, king of Salem, king of peace, or pe king of uh, Shalom. So, but it doesn't give an actual name. Melchizedek is actually a, a title, a, a king of righteousness. Um, and there's a video, actually, I'm, I'm hoping to actually embed into my blog, so hopefully you can go there and uh, check it out. It's great, great teaching. Uh, I believe it's called the Melchizedek Connection. Uh, it, it was not from Jim Staley, but it's from another uh, speaker who was there at Passion for Truth Ministries. And uh, he, he gives a great... Uh, amount of detail. I remember listening to him uh, last year when the teaching first came out and it was really good um, uh, and I was uh, really just in, in immersed in what he was saying. So I'm going to put that up on my blog, be looking out for that um, by <laughs> before this is uploaded. I couldn't think of what I was going to say. Um, so with that said though, he goes into great detail. The things I won't be getting into, uh, but he does make mention that the Melchizedek here uh, is very widely believed by many historians uh, and researchers to be the son of Noah, Shem. Um, and there's specific reasons of it. Uh, he says that you can find it in uh, Kephabet, or the uh, second Peter. Uh, he talks about the eighth uh, righteous person, or something to that effect, being Noah. And so it's like there's this order... And uh, that's made mention, uh, this order of the priesthood of Melchizedek, which I will get into now um, uh, in Tehillim, or Psalms 110. Now, I am going to be reading from a uh, Masoretic text, um, and there is a reason for that I will mention in a moment. Now, this is a uh, Psalm of David, David, um, and in this particular version, let me go ahead and read it this way. Uh, verse 1, The Lord said unto my Lord, You've probably heard that term a lot, um, and it makes no sense. <laughs> the Lord said to my Lord, right? Um, now, you probably already know this, but I'll go ahead and say it. Anytime you see uh, the the word Lord or God in all capitals, that is where uh, there is this conspiracy to actually cover up the name of the Almighty, uh, which was wrong of them to do. They did it what seems like noble cause, you know, to respect the name, not to be taken in vain and so on. But you're actually supposed to say his name, um, but in proper context, you know. I uh, I usually like to actually just say, you know, the Almighty or the Father, excuse me. And, um, you know, uh, sometimes I will say Yah, the poetic short form of his name. Uh, my particular preference, as you probably have picked up uh, over the past few podcasts, or if you've been following me on YouTube for the past few years, uh, I've, uh, through my research, come to the conclude uh, of the use of the name Yehovah, something I'll probably get into another time, uh, unless you want to go to my YouTube channel, Mikhail86, on youtube.com forward slash Mikhail86, I spelled it wrong actually, <laughs> when I first put up, uh, the channel up, it's M-I-H-A-A-L-86, and uh, there's a video there uh, call, titled, uh, Why I use the name Jehovah or some, something like that. Um, but okay, so it, so all that to say right here in this first verse, he's actually not saying the Lord saith unto my Lord. He's actually saying Jehovah said unto my Lord. Um, but then, yeah, that's fine. Um, he says, sit you at my right hand, or sit thou at my right hand. So, those of us, so, yeah, those of us who are followers of Yeshua know that uh, the Mashiach, the Messiah, Yeshua, is the one who sits at the right hand, the right hand of authority of Yehovah, of, of the throne. So he says, Yehovah said unto my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. The rod of your strength, uh, Yehovah will send out of Zion, or Zion. Rule thou in the midst of... Uh, this Elizabethan English man. <laughs> Rule thou in the midst of thine enemies. Thy people offer themselves willingly in the day of thy warfare. In uh, adornment, ad adornments? <laughs> Sorry. 
I'm not, I'm not good at talking today. I'm very sleepy, and I know it's the Shabbat and everything, so it's kind of normal. Okay, in adornments of holiness, from the womb of the dawn, thine is the dew, D-E-W, of thy youth. Yehovah hath sworn and will not repent. Thou art a Cohen forever, a priest, after the manner or the order of Melchizedek. The Lord at thy right hand. Now here is one of the main reasons I wanted to read this particular text. As well as the fact that it was easier to just pick one up instead of just, you know, flipping to it. <laughs> um, it says, the Lord at your right hand. Uh, now, agreed, it is the Lord at the right hand. In the Hebrew, uh, Hebraic Roots Bible, if you look at that verse which is verse 5. Now, in the Masoretic text, it says, The Lord at thy right hand doth crush kings in the day of his wrath. In uh, the Hebraic roots, by the way, the Masoretic text is a fairly new version of Scripture. Uh, I think it dates back to something like the 11th century, uh, something to that effect. But there, uh, from my understanding, there are earlier texts that do not say, The Lord at thy right hand. And this is why I bring up um, Hebraic Roots Bible, which they don't use Yehovah, they use the term Yahweh, but uh, that's fine. It says, Yahweh at your right hand shatters kings in the day of his anger. He shall judge among the nations, he shall fill with dead bodies, he shall shatter uh, heads over much land, he shall drink out of the torrent on the way, therefore he shall lift up the head. So you see a bit of uh, a chad comparing going on here, because the Mesorites, uh they actually changed uh, a lot of things in, in Scripture uh, that were pertaining to the Mashiach, or anything that would allude to, uh, you know, Yeshua being echad, or being one with the Father. So they, they kind of made... Uh, this particular passage, which I believe the original version being Yehovah at thy right hand. Um, this is something else that, you know, it's about Yeshua bearing the name of Yehovah. And there is uh, more talk on this uh, in Scripture. Uh, this is something I will not be getting into right now, but I wanted to point that out because pro probably most modern versions of Scripture will say the Lord... Uh, insinuating Yeshua, which it is Yeshua, but it's it's all it's Yehovah, and it's that Echad connection there. And I'm not, you know, this is something else I say in my book. I don't, I, I'm not giving a uh, an affirmation uh, for or against the the doctrine of the Trinity. I do believe Yeshua and Yehovah to be Echad, to be one. Uh, but there's more to it than a Trinity doctrine. Uh, more to it than a uh, your average uh, mainstream Christian church would talk about um, or admit. And uh, I've, I've expressed several times in past teachings that I just have too much respect for the Almighty and His Messiah and, and the Ruach to say, okay, He is this way and, and, and this is what He is. It's what Scripture has revealed to us, and where Scripture has revealed to us a lot more than a Trinity doctrine. The The... The being Echad in Yehovah is so much more deeper. Uh, and it's something I do hope to get into more later. Um, but, you know, there uh, I actually have a whole hour of teaching on YouTube about this particular topic. But I wanted to point that out to you, just to, just to kind of get you possibly to see there's more to it than that. And hopefully it'll spur you to also look into it more. But, uh, let, getting back to the topic of Melchizedek, here you have, um, you know, I'm not going to read this version anymore. <laughs> um, I'm going to look at uh, what this says. Uh, back at verse 4, Yehovah has sworn and will not repent. You are a Kohen forever according to the order of Melchizedek. So it's this oath that he says. Uh, he has sworn this, and he will not repent of this oath. You are a Kohen forever. Kohen uh, being the Hebrew word for priest. Forever according to the order of Melchizedek. Now, this is the second time in Scripture that Melchizedek is mentioned. And now it's it, it's kind of opening up more to us who are reading this passage, uh, you know, about 5,000, 6,000 years removed from the original text. Uh, well, in the in the case of the Psalms, more about 3,000. But, um... 
he, he's saying that there is an order of Melchizedek. So you have this priesthood order, this priestly order. Um, and he also goes on to say, uh, uh, Jehovah at your right hand shatters kings in the day of his anger, uh, and he shall judge among the nations. Now, if you look back in uh, Barashit 14, you see something very interesting. Uh, Melchizedek comes out with bread and wine as like this peace offering. Uh, and again, this is uh, Shem and Avram, uh, you know, and all these uh, different kings, there's, there's certain different kings, and I can't say them by name right now, I'm not sh uh, completely sure who it is, but I do know that Avram uh, killed a number of these kings uh, in order to get Lot back, in which these kings were actually related to, uh, blood related to uh, Shem. Now, th this is also assuming that Shem is, was the Mechizedek, that um, Barashit 14 was referring to. So you have these uh, these killing of kings, slaying of kings, and so on, and Melchizedek, the king of righteousness and the king of peace, comes out with bread and wine as like this peace offering, and Avram gives him a tenth of his uh, spoils. Um, now here again in Tehillim uh, 110, you see something else mentioned in reference to the Melchizedek, or the order of Melchizedek, that uh, Jehovah at your right hand shatters kings in the day of his anger. So again, you have the mention of the kings. And he shall judge among the nations, he shall and judge uh, someone who uh, judge uh, justly bringing righteousness, uh, and so on. Uh, he shall fill with dead bodies, and he shall shatter heads over much land. He shall drink out of the torrent on the way, therefore he shall lift up the head. Uh, so you have this picture of a Melchizedek, this judge, someone who shatters kings, um, and, and it basically, someone who basically lays down the law. Um, and, and so now that brings us to Ivrit, or Hebrews. Now I made mention of this. In the, in the Tanakh, uh, Achizedek is actually mentioned, I think, twice. And that's it. Uh, you got in uh, the entirety of Scripture. He's mentioned 12 times. Now on my blog, I mentioned that like 12 is looked at as the number of perfection. Um... And actually, let me bring that up so I can read it more accurately. Because I quoted a uh, website. Um, my cat's clawing at the carpet wanting in. Um, okay, so let me read this quote to you. Here it is. Uh, now, this quote comes from a website called BibleStudy.org. It says, the meaning of 12, which is considered a perfect number, is that it symbolizes God's power and authority. And there you have power and authority, which is what the, uh, the right hand of the throne is. My cat really wants in. Um, he's not getting in. As well as serving as a perfect governmental foundation. Now there you have the righteousness part, the justice part, the judgment part, the government foundation. Uh, as well as serving as a perfect government foundation, it can also symbolize completeness, shalom, or the uh, or the nation of Israel as a whole, king of Salem, an earlier name for Jerusalem, Yerushalayim, the king of Salem. Um, and also, if, uh, if you want to go even further with that, the nation of Israel as a whole made up of the twelve tribes... You know, there's just, uh, there's so much deepness, and I say that, uh, it, there's just profound deepness found throughout this entire topic of the Melchizedek. Um, so, let's get into Hebrews. Now, I'm not going to actually read chapters 5 and 6, because that would take up a lot of time. Um, I've gone on 20 minutes now. Um, so we'll get into, uh, chapter, well, you know what, Let, let's actually do this. Let's, uh, we might actually skip around a little bit. Now, this particular section, let's go to chapter 5, Hebrews chapter 5. Now, verse 5, uh, I'm actually reading from the New King James Version, but I'll reply, place the Greek words uh, with Hebrew. So, also, Messiah did not glorify himself to become Kohen Hakadol, high priest, but it was he who said to him, Jehovah said to him, You are my son, today I have begotten you. And he also says in another place, and this is where he quotes uh, Tehillim or Psalm 110.4, You are a priest, a Kohen forever, according to the order of Melchizedek, 
who in the days of his flesh, when he had offered up prayers and supplications with vehement cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death, and was heard because of his godly fear. Uh, though he was a son, yet he learned obedience by the things which he suffered, and having been perfected, he became the author of eternal salvation to all who obey him, called by God, by Yah, as a high priest according to the order of Melchizedek. And he quotes uh, Psalm 110 again. Um, and he, you know, he, whoever wrote Hebrews, he, he goes on to say, of whom we have much to say and hard to explain, since you have become dull of hearing. Uh, he goes on to tell them basically that they're very immature <laughs> in their spirituality. Um, but we'll skip over that part. Um, basically, the series saying that you need to progress more. Um, okay, so now we're at chapter 7. Uh, verse 1, For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest, or Cohen of the Most High God, El Elyon, so he's clearly got on his mind at this point, he, he has on his mind whoever the author of Hebrews was, uh, he's thinking about the particular point in which uh, Melchizedek and Avram met up back in Bereshit 14. Uh, he, he makes mention of Abraham, actually, if you look at the verse above, uh, in, look at chapter 6, 19, it says, This hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, uh, steadfast in which enters the presence behind the evil, um, where the forerunner has entered for us, even Yeshua, having become Kohen Hagadol forever according to the order of Melchizedek. Um, I thought I saw Abraham's name. <laughs> I was reading in the wrong place. I'm all over the place, as you can tell right now. Uh, again, very sleepy. Um, now, for those of you watching on YouTube, this, uh, my iPad shut off, so I had to bring on my iPhone. I don't know how much space I have on it, though, but I'll try. Um, oh, you know what? If I had kept just reading, I would have talked about what I was meaning to talk about. <laughs> That's funny. Okay, so, verse 1, chapter 7. For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, who met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him. So again, he, he even makes mention of the Melchizedek and the kings. Again, you have the same uh, order of things going on here. Verse 2, To him also Abraham gave a tenth of part of all, first being translated king of righteousness, and then also king of Salem, meaning king of peace. So you can tell that this was uh, translated from Hebrew into Greek when, he's, when they're giving the translation. Because otherwise it would be like King of Re uh, Righteousness being translated King of Righteousness, and it makes no sense. Um, verse 3, Without father, without mother, without genealogy, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made like the Son of God, remains a priest continually. That's interesting, and he goes on to explain himself, which I will let the author do now. Verse 4, Now consider how great this man to whom even the patriarch Abraham gave a tenth of the spoils. And indeed, those who are of the sons of Levi, uh, who received the priesthood, uh, the Levitical priesthood, uh, have a commandment to receive tithes from the people according to the Torah. That is, from their brethren, though they came from the loins of Abraham. So they're of the same genealogy here, same bloodline. But he whose genealogy is, de is not derived from them received tithes from Avraham, and blessed him who had the promises. Uh, he whose genealogy is not derived from them, uh, that's referring to Melchizedek. Uh, verse 7, Now beyond all contradiction, the lesser is blessed by the better. Here mortal men receive tithes, but there he receives them, of whom it is witnessed that he lives. Even Levi who receives tithes, paid tithes, through Abraham, so to speak, for he was still in the loins of his father when Melchizedek met him. So it's kind of talking about how uh, Abraham gave the tithe, and because Abraham gave, uh, who is Levi's ancestor, in turn Levi also gave, and it's this picture of this generational thing. Uh, now verse 11. Therefore, if perfection were through the Levitical priesthood, for under it the people received the Torah, 
uh, or the law in this case, um, talking about the sacrificial system and the uh, order of the temple and so on, um, was further need, I'm sorry, what further need was there that another priest should rise according to the order of Melchizedek and not to be called according to the order of Aharon or Aaron? For the priesthood being changed, of necessity there is also change of the Torah. For he of whom, and uh, I'll explain this in a second. For he of whom these things are spoken belongs to another tribe from which no man has officiated at the altar. For it is evident that Adoni, our Lord, uh, arose from Yehuda, Judah, of which tribe Moshe, Moses, spoke nothing concerning priesthood. And it is yet far more evident if, in the likeness of Melchizedek, there arises another Kohen, priest, who has come not according to the Torah of a fleshly commandment, or a law, uh, to the law of a fleshly commandment, but according to the power of an endless life. For he testifies, you are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek, for on the one hand there is an annulling of the former commandment because of its weakness and unprofitableness, referring to the sacrificial system and the Levitical priesthood. For the Torah made nothing perfect, which is true. Um, the sacrificial system, uh, the covering, the blood covering the sins, is not to take away, it just covers it up. It's like, uh, you know, you, you sweep your dust under the rug, you're not getting rid of it, you're just covering it. Uh, it's it's kind of that idea that he's referring to here um, with the Levitical priesthood. That's what they were responsible for, uh, performing the sacrifices and also all the duties in and around the temple. Um, so it didn't make perfect, but he'll he goes on to explain. Um, on the other hand, there is there is the bringing in of a better hope through which we draw near to Yah. And inasmuch, verse 20, as he was not made Cohen without an oath, for they have become priests without an oath, but he with an oath by him who said to him, Jehovah has sworn and will not relent or will not, will not repent. You are a Cohen forever according to the order of Melchizedek. By so much more, Yeshua has become a surety of a better covenant. Also, there were many priests because they were prevented by death from continuing. Uh, talking about the uh, moral, uh, mortality of the priests at the time, they, you know, they met their end by death. They, uh, they eventually died. They were not eternal, uh, you know, they were not immortal. But, verse 24, he, because he continues forever, Yeshua, uh, as an unchangeable priesthood, or has an unchangeable priesthood, the order of Melchizedek. Therefore, he is also able to save to the uttermost those who come to Yah through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. Uh, and wrapping this up here, uh, verse 26, For such a high priest, Kohen HaGadol, was fitting for us, who is Kodesh, or Kadosh, holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and has become higher than the heavens, who does not need daily, as those high priests, to offer up sacrifices, first for his own sins and then for the uh, people's. For this he did once for all when he offer up, offered up himself. For the Torah appoints as high priests men who have weakness. But the word of the oath which came after the Torah, appoints the Son who has been perfected forever. Now, you might be kind of shuffling in your seat and becoming slightly uncomfortable with this idea of the Torah changing. And in all fairness, first of all, the Torah, as far as the Levitical priesthood is concerned, requires a temple. We have no temple. Other than that which is in heaven as well as our bodies, which is the temple of the Ruach Kodesh, the uh, uh, Holy Spirit. Um, likewise, also, Yeshua offering up himself as a sacrifice to atone uh, and to cleanse us, to um, take away sin, 
he being the perfect sacrifice, if he, if he was an imperfect sacrifice, we would need an, yet another sacrifice. However, because he offered himself a righteous person, Yeshua being righteous, of the order of Melchizedek, king of righteousness. See, the king of righteousness, that term doesn't just mean that he will judge. It also means that he is of righteousness. Um, men throughout scripture were righteous men, and that, uh, as Second uh, Peter talks about, it's this order of righteousness. Those who are righteous, you could safely, I, I believe you could safely assume at this point, that they are of the order of Melchizedek. Um, but up to Noah, he was the eighth. Uh, and that, and that's, that's under the assumption of this order of Melchizedek. Um, and that's the reason why Jehovah chose Noah to actually build the ark and save his own family from this great flood that was to wipe out humanity because of their wickedness. He found one. That was righteous, and that was Noah. Uh, and now the scripture, the text doesn't actually come out and say that Noah was Melchizedek, but he was righteous. Um, so, getting back to Yeshua, his sacrifice being perfect, him being a righteous person, became our high priest, offering up himself and uh, undergoing the priesthood of Melchizedek, of the order of Melchizedek. Um, therefore, we are no longer of need of this Levitical priesthood. Um, it was what kept us going at the time that we did not have the perfect sacrifice. The Levitical priesthood was good for its time. And uh, Shaul, Paul actually talks about it being a tutor for us to, uh, you know, continue on and striving for perfection and so on. But because of Yeshua now, we still obey the commandments. The, uh, we still keep the Moedim, the Shabbat. Uh, we still do not murder. We still do not have sexual relations with uh, the same gender as ourselves or with, uh, you know, we do not perform incest or have uh, sexual relationships with uh, animals. Those are still in effect, all these things, as, as well as the things that, you know, I, I like to, I have a bit of a saying that I say to myself sometimes, once an abomination, always an abomination. And an abomination to Jehovah is to uh, eat unclean meat which he never defined as food. So all these things you still do. However, the Levitical priesthood was of the sacrificial system as well as the duties performed in and around the temple. We have a perfect sacrifice now through Yeshua. We are of no more need of uh, rams and bulls and uh, so on. And, and, and we don't, uh, likewise, we don't have a temple to go to anymore. Therefore, the, Levit the Levitical priesthood at this point has no more uh, use. However, he, being of the order of Melchizedek, he performs all the duties required in us, the temple of the Ruach, in the temple that is in heaven, and he is the sacrifice. That's what it's talking about has changed. Uh, in a sense, I, I think you could actually say, too, that it was more so transferred uh, from the Levitical to the Melchizedek, because at first we were under Melchizedek before the Levitical. And then Yeshua sought to, uh, you know, he freed the Hebrew slaves, uh, and he started setting up uh, this nation of Israel, and he gave them the Torah, and uh, these mitzvah, these commandments for us to follow, uh, it is, quite simply put, looked at as a path to follow. And now that path is no longer under the priesthood of Le uh, the uh, Levitical priesthood, it's under the uh, order of Melchizedek priesthood. And it is just, there's so much more to it than I can share with you now. I've already gone over what I consider my limit. Uh, but I hope this inspires you to look into Yeshua as the Melchizedek and to seek out what it, that means. Melchizedek, king of righteousness. Mel, uh, king of Salem, king of priest, king of Jerusalem. And the fact that we would be a nation of kings and priests, I believe also we are to follow of the order of Melchizedek, or to actually to some to figure out the way to speak the blessing of the Melchizedek over our lives and over the lives of our family, especially those of us who are uh, priest of our home, the Cohen of our home. 
if we are the Kohen of our home, then we should be of the order of Melchizedek as well. And that, again, is just following in the footsteps of our Messiah, Yeshua, um, who obeyed the Torah. <laughs> so I'm going to wrap it up here, and uh, hopefully I'll get a I, I will uh, try my best to get that recording uh, that teaching recorded uh, next week uh, in reference to the Moedim, uh, talking about the times and what dates to be looking for and so on. Um, you know, I, I have a contact me section on my website. If you have any uh, questions, comments, concerns, whatever else, you can click on contact me and uh, I, I will get that. Um, you can also, if you would like to donate um, to my cause, which is explaining Torah to uh, believers as well as uh, teaching uh, others about Yeshua um, and the truth of an existing and eternal uh, Elohim, then uh, please, you know, do so. Um, but also get my book. Uh, not only do I believe that would be a blessing to you, but you can also hand that off to others uh, to be a blessing to them. And in turn, that also blesses me as a, a, in a sense as a donation. So at least in that way, you get something out of it uh, if you choose to donate in that way. Uh, links for all these things on my website, www.michaeldsofair.com, Sofair, S-O-F-E-R. And, um, you know, I also have a blog uh, and a Facebook page, uh, facebook.com forward slash Hebraic Perspectives. And um, I'm on YouTube, youtube.com forward slash Michael86, which I mentioned earlier. Uh, and I'm also on Twitter under that same name. So, with all that said... <laughs> Uh, I apologize for all the kind of back and forths and long awkward pauses and also my camera cutting out, uh, which has not happened. I have no idea why that happened, but um, I hope this has been a blessing to you and uh, please test everything. Uh, just because I say it and you trust me, uh, don't, because <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm just as uh, imperfect as anybody else and I can make mistakes uh, scripturally speaking as well. Uh, so please test everything, and uh, if you have a concern as to a certain point that y you don't think lines up with what scripture teaches, um, you know, let me know. And, you know, because that, that's how I got to this point. Someone challenged me on the Sabbath, and, um, here I am keeping the Sabbath. <laughs> uh, thanks to my friend for that. But, um, okay, I'm shutting it down. Thank you very much. Total Rabbah. Hallelujah. Be blessed. And uh, Shalom to you.